Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Update. We're pleased that you've joined us today. And before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, Refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, uh, we have great speakers with us today from Moss Adams. We have Ashley Austin, partner, and Kevin muller Liley, senior manager. Their bios and contact information are in your webcast console for your convenience. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Ashley to get the presentation started. Thank you so much, Amy, and welcome everyone. We're really happy to have you here with us today. First, let's go over our learning objectives. So at the end of this presentation, we will hopefully have identified the major revisions of the more recent GASB pronouncements, described GASB's recent statements and their impact on governmental entities, and identified a timeline and steps to take in order to prepare for the implementation of these new standards. So let's dive in. So we're gonna go through statement number 91, conduit debt obligation, statement number 94, public-private and public-public partnership, statement number 96, subscription-based IT arrangements, statement number 99, omnibus 2022, statement 100, accounting for changes in error corrections, and statement number 101, compensated absences. But before we get going, let's kick it off with a poll. So which new GASB standard do you believe will have the most significant impact on your organization? Is it A, GASB 91, GASB 94, GASB 96, or GASB 101? And just as a reminder, you do have to click the button and then click Submit in order to receive CPE credit. So we'll give people around 30 to 45 seconds to get your answer posted here before we look at the responses. All right, so it looks like uh, statement 96 
received the most responses at 50 percent, which we'll talk a little bit about, and then uh, Statement 101. So thanks for engaging in that poll. Go ahead and go on to Gatsby Statement 91, Conduit Debt Obligations. The standard was issued back in May of 2019. Let's talk a little bit about the summary of changes. So as the slide indicates, you know, the primary objectives of this statement are to provide a single method of reporting conduit debt obligations by issuers, and then really eliminate diversity and practice associated with commitments extended by issuers, and then also arrangements associated with conduit debt obligations, as well as related note disclosures. The statement really achieves these objectives by clarifying the existing definition of a conduit debt obligation. It establishes that a conduit debt obligation is not a liability of the issuer. It also establishes standards for accounting and financial reporting of additional commitments and voluntary commitments extended by issuers, as well as arrangements associated with conduit debt obligations, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And then of course, with all standards, it does improve those required note disclosures. So what is conduit debt? Um, this is a great slide that kind of gives a pictorial view of it. For accounting and financial reporting purposes, a conduit debt obligation is a debt instrument issued in the name of a state or local government, so the issuer, that is for the benefit of a third party primarily liable for the repayment of the debt instrument, so the third party obligor. A conduit debt obligation has all five of the following characteristics. So there are at least three parties involved, which you see on the on the slide here, an issuer, generally a state or local government, a third party obligor, the borrower and a debt holder or a debt trustee. There may be more than one third party obligor, debt holder or debt trustee. The issuer and the third party obligor are not within the same financial reporting entity. The debt obligation is not a parity bond of the issuer, nor is it cross collateralized with other debt of the issuer. So just as a reminder, a parity bond is an issued bond with equal rights to a claim as other bonds already issued. The third party obligor or its agent, not the issuer, ultimately receives the proceeds from that debt issuance. And then the third party obligor, not the issuer, is primarily obligated for the payment of all amounts associated with the debt obligation. So those debt service payments. So there are three types of uh, commitments as really displayed on this slide. So the first is a limited commitment. So an issuer of a conduit debt obligation makes a limited commitment when they enter into that agreement uh, to at least at a minimum maintain the issuer's tax exempt status. In a limited commitment, the issuer assumes no responsibility for paying those debt service payments beyond the resources provided to the obligor, if any were provided. To the obligor. An issuer can extend an additional or voluntary commitment of its own resources. So under an additional commitment, the issuer agrees to support some debt service payments only in the event that the third party obligor is or will be unable to do so. Under a voluntary commitment, an issuer does not make an additional commitment, but on a voluntary basis decides to make a debt service payment or request an appropriation for a debt service payment in the event that the third party is or will be unable to do so. So under an additional commitment under that section of the slide, it does give a few examples where, you know, the issuer may extend a moral obligation or it extends an appropriation pledge or a financial guarantee, um, pledging its own property revenue or other assets of security. Those would all be considered additional commitments. So an issuer with a limited commitment shouldn't recognize the conduit debt obligation as a liability. It recognizes nothing when that debt is issued. An issuer should recognize a liability associated with an additional commitment to support debt service payments and an expense if qualitative factors indicate that it's more likely than not that the issuer will support one or more debt service payments. And just as a reminder, you know, more likely than not is greater than 50% probability. So, and the amount recognized should be measured as the discounted present value of the best estimate of the future outflows expected to be incurred. So what, what amount are you going to pay? What's that best estimate? And then discount it back to present value. An issuer that has not made an additional or a voluntary commitment 
they are not required to perform an annual evaluation to determine whether that recognition criteria are met. But as long as the conduit debt obligation is outstanding and an issuer has made an additional commitment, that issuer should evaluate at least annually whether that recognition criteria are have been met and a liability should be recognized. So an issuer of conduit debt obligations may enter into arrangements that are associated with conduit debt obligations, and those arrangements have all of the following characteristics that are listed on this slide. So the construction or the acquisition of the capital asset is financed with the proceeds from the conduit debt obligation. The issuer retains the title to the capital asset from the beginning of the arrangement. The payments from the obligor are to cover the debt service payments and the payment schedule of the arrangement coincides with the debt service payment schedule. So how do you account for those arrangements? So if the issuer completely relinquishes title, no liability for conduit debt, no capital asset, and no receivable for payments to be expected to be received. If the issuer retains title and the obligor has use of the entire asset, then as it says on the slide, there's no liability for conduit debt, no receivable for payments, and no capital asset. But at the end of the arrangement, that issuer does recognize the capital asset at acquisition value and then an inflow of resources in the same amount. The third item here, issuer retains title and the obligor only has use of portions of the asset. No liability for conduit debt, no receivable for payment, but you do recognize the entire capital asset at acquisition value and a deferred inflow of resources for the same amount recognized over the term of the arrangement in a rational way. So in terms of disclosures, of course, with all new standards, we're, we're going to have some additional disclosures to consider items listed or are required disclosure, you know, if you're... Um, a description of that conduit debt obligation. If you have any limited or voluntary or additional commitments, then there's going to be some additional descriptions related to those. If you have an additional commitment that the issuer has made, then you want to also describe the legal authority and the limits for extending those commitments, the length of time of the commitments and the arrangements, if any, for recovering payments. Uh, and then finally, the aggregate outstanding principal amount of all those debt obligations that share the same type of commitment at the end of the reporting period. When the standard is adopted, uh, you should apply those changes retroactively by restating the financial statements for all prior periods presented if it's practical. But how do you prepare to implement the standard? So first, you know, begin to inventory all of the conduit debt that has been issued. Consider if there's any that's currently reported in the financial statements. Uh, next, determine if you as the governmental entity has extended any commitments or entered into any asset arrangements where a liability may need to be recorded. And then, of course, look at your controls and your processes uh, really to ensure that conduit debt is monitored and tracked appropriately, that commitments, if you're extending any, are evaluated on an annual basis, and that that evaluation is documented, and then that the necessary information is obtained for financial statement disclosure purposes. I'm going to hand it off to Kevin to talk about GASB Statement 94. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, maybe even a good evening. I'm um, going to talk about Statement 94, public-private and public-public public partnerships. Um, I'll keep it short by referring to these going forward as uh, PPPs or P3s. Statement was issued in March 2020, so a few years ago. And really the purpose of it is to fill a hole that was left after GASB 60 on service concession arrangements was introduced now over a decade um, ago. Um, people look at Statement 60, and what um, the GASB saw was that governments would see that rates weren't being set by the government itself, and that really scoped um, users or, excuse me, reporters out from uh, reporting service concession arrangements. So there's a hole there, and um, they issued PPPs with Statement 5094 in order to fill that gap. So um, I want to be clear, if you have any uh, transactions meeting the definition of an SCA, a service concession arrangement, 
Statement 60 is now superseded. So going forward, um, you want to follow Statement 94. So um, there are a number of governments, a um, number of agreements that governments are entering into. Statement 94 focuses on a few types of financial arrangements and specifically how to differentiate between each of those. As you can see in the italics and bold, uh, we're talking about the right to use an asset or operate an asset. So that's the common denominator here with these types of arrangements. Um, it could be something you can reach out and touch like a piece of equipment, or it could be an intangible asset like software located in the cloud. Um, Ashley is going to touch on uh, the subscription-based IT arrangements a little bit later. Another common uh, trait with these arrangements is their exchange or exchange-like transactions. So nobody's receiving anything for free here. Um, these are exchange or exchange-like transactions. In terms of leases, I think we have a good understanding of that now. We've probably all implemented Statement 87 uh, about the right to use another entity's non-financial asset. A PPP arrangement differs from a lease because the asset is being used to provide service to the public and is an asset that's often may not be pre-existing, meaning it's something that's going to be constructed or perhaps it's a pre-existing asset that requires some improvements. That's not to say pre-existing assets not requiring any improvements are automatically leases. Um, I, I say all that to say um, there's a lot of different types of ways we can go in order to determine how we should account for these types of transactions. And I have a pretty good slide coming up uh, to uh, help us understand what guidance to follow. Here's the terminology for PPPs, um, and you can see it's very similar to Statement 87 in, in leases. Um, under leases, we have lessors, you know, the, the, like who owns the asset. In the PPP realm, we're calling those the transfer. So the transfer is the uh, entity that owns the asset. And then instead of le leases, we have operators. Those are the ones that are have the right to use the asset. In terms of the intangible right to use asset, underlying asset liability, the terminology is all the same there. Here's the definition of the PPP. It's an arrangement in which a government, a transfer, contracts with an operator government or a non-government entity to provide public services by conveying control of the right to operate or use infrastructure or other non-financial assets for a period of time, again, in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Uh, the key components, you have a contract, an agreement in place, providing public service, it's an infrastructure or similar type of capital asset, and it's an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Here's that slide I was talking about that I think is a really good way to understand how to recognize and measure these types of transactions. Starting at the top, we have something that we think is either a PPP or a lease. So the first thing we want to do is consider, is this an asset that is pre-existing or is it something that is going to be constructed? Well, let's first look on the left. And we're talking about assets that are not currently existing. Well, then we ask ourselves, is this a service concession arrangement or not uh, an SCA? Let's go over the SCA criteria quickly. And, and there's four key points there that need to be met in order to meet the definition of an SCA. First off, the transfer is conveying the right to provide public services through the use and operation of of an underlying PPP asset in exchange for significant consideration, such as an upfront payment, installment payments, a new facility, or something like improvements to an existing facility. Second piece of criteria is the operator is collecting and is compensated for fees from third parties 
The next requirement is the transfer is determining or has the ability to modify or approve which services the operator is required to provide, to whom the operator is required to provide the services to, and the prices or rates that can be charged for those services. And then the final criteria for SEA is the transfer is entitled to significant residual interest in the service utility of the underlying PPP asset at the end of the arrangement. So if all that's met, we're going to look at statement 94, paragraph 15, and that's going to tell us that a transfer is going to report the capital asset when it's put into operation. Now, if we are building an asset, but it's not an SCA, we're going to follow statement 94, paragraph 16. That tells us the transfer is going to report a receivable for the capital asset, and that's going to be measured at the operator's carrying value as of a future date of ownership. So that's if we're, um, we don't have a pre-existing asset. Now let's turn to the right in that second row from the top. What if we do have a pre-existing asset? Well, first we need to ask ourselves, do improvements need to be made by the operator? If they do, we're going to look at paragraph 14 in statement 94. And what the transfer is going to recognize is the improvements made once they're placed in service. If there's no improvements that need to be made, we ask ourselves again, is it an SEA? If it does meet that definition, uh, we go back to paragraph 15, which I've already discussed. The transfer reports capital asset when it's put into operation. And then finally, if we have a pre-existing asset, no improvements need to be made, and it's not an SEA. We're just looking at a garden variety lease, and we look at statement 87. So I think this is a pretty good roadmap to tell us um, sometimes we're confused what type of um, transaction this is, how should we report it. I think this is a good roadmap to show us how we recognize and measure this specific type of transaction. In terms of the transfer reporting, I already touched on this a little bit. On the left talks about if you have installment payments, um, maybe you, you didn't just get one cash payment up front. If you have installment payments, you're going to record a receivable, and then the offsetting side of that is a deferred inflow of resources. If the underlying PPP asset is a new asset or an existing asset that has been improved, improved, excuse me, uh, the PPP is uh, for an SDA. You're going to again recognize a capital asset at the acquisition value when it's placed in operation. Not an SDA. It's going to be a receivable. And then in terms of the operator reporting, um, you're going to have a liability for installment payments to be made. And the other side of that entry is an tangible right to use asset. Um, something I want to point out with this slide, if you put the operator and transfer slide um, next to each other, it would be a little confusing. But I want to make it clear that both the transfer and operator aren't going to be reporting a capital asset at the same time. That wouldn't make any sense. The operator is the one that's initially reporting the right to use that asset. And once trans ownership transfers, the operator no longer reports the right to use asset, and the transferor now recognizes a capital asset. On to the next slide. Availability payment arrangements are a small part of Statement 94. Um, this is where a government contracts with another entity to operate or maintain the government's infrastructure or other non-financial assets. The entity is going to receive payments for the government based on the assets availability for use. And these assets may be based on the physical condition of the asset or an achievement of certain available measures. Um, also considered in the APAs are things like design, finance, construction, or service components. Some basic provisions 
for an availability payment arrangement relates to design, finance, or construction of infrastructure or other non-financial assets where ownership transfers by the contracts and the government reports this as a finance purchase of the asset. Now, if instead the arrangement relates to operations, it's expensed in the period the payments relate. So rather than treating it as a financed asset purchase, it's going to be expensed. Um, as with any standard, you're going to have some additional disclosure. I think these are the type of disclosures we'd expect to see. Um, the transfer is going to have a general description of the transaction, the nature and amounts of the assets, and deferred inflows of resources recognized. Of course, the discount rate is in there, just like with uh, leases. Um, any nature and extent of rights retained by the transfer and then any guarantees and commitments are going to be disclosed. The effective date for this is um, going to start off first for the June 30, uh, 2023 uh, fiscal year end. So that's, um, we're about three weeks past there. Um, if implementation is applied to any earlier fiscal year, uh, the PPPs should be recognized and measured using the facts and circumstances that existed at the earliest fiscal year uh, we stated. I don't know that um, at, at this point in time that's going to be applicable. We're, we're probably looking at implementation because uh, we're uh, just past June 30, 2023. So that's statement 94. And I'm going to turn it back to Ashley to talk about um, statement 96. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, so Gatsby Statement 96, uh, subscription-based IT arrangements, also referred to as SPEDAs. I've also heard SPEDAs. I'm probably going to use SPEDAs in this presentation. It was issued a number of years ago now. It feels like in May of 2020. So first, let's kick this off with a polling question. So what is your organization's current status on implementing Gatsby 96? A, we've got this, we've already adopted it um, in tandem with GAS 87. We're adopting this year and have a solid plan that's underway for implementation. We're adopting this year, but we're not sure where to start with implementation. Or I've heard of GAS 96, but need some more information on how it might impact us. So just as a reminder, click the button that uh, for the item that applies to you and click submit. Remember, you do have to click on at least three of the four polls in order to get your CPE. And we give around 30 to 45 seconds for each polling question. All right, thanks, Amy. And he's the one who's running this in the background. So it sounds like most of you uh, are adopting this year and have a solid plan that's underway for implementation. And those of you that have heard of 96 but need more information, we're glad that you're here. Hopefully you get the information that you're looking for. So what is a SPEDA? Let's, let's ask uh, that question first. So it sounds very much like a lease. Uh, take a listen. So a SPEDA is a is defined as a contract that conveys control of the right to use another party's information technology software alone or in combination with tangible capital assets as specified in the contract for a period of time in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. I think Kevin's earlier slide that had, you know, the PPP, SPEDA, and GASB 87 leases all um, in one slide, the definitions there, it really shows the similarities of these three standards, 87, 94, and 96. 
So the second bullet on this slide really is a preview into the scope exception. So I'll just advance to this slide to talk a little bit about what it excludes. So GASB Statement 96 does exclude contracts that are a combination of IT software and tangible capital assets that meet the definition of Statement 87. But when you look at the software and the hardware, the software component is insignificant when compared to the total cost of the underlying capital asset. So think of a computer with an operating software or potentially a smart copier that's connected to an IT system. You wouldn't necessarily include those in your evaluation of SPEDAs. Those would be um, insignificant in relation to the asset as a whole. This statement also doesn't apply to governments that provide the right to use their IT software and associated tangible capital assets to other entities through SPEDA, so they're recognizing revenue for that, and it uh, scopes that out, the standard does. It also scopes out contracts that meet the definition of a public-private or public-public partnership, as Kevin went through, or licensing arrangements that provide a perpetual license to governments to use a vendor's computer software, and those are subject to Statement 51 and scoped out of 96. So the subscription term is the period during which a government has a non-cancelable right to use the underlying IT assets. It also includes several periods depending upon whether or not it's reasonably certain that either a government or the speed of speed of vendor will exercise or not exercise an option to extend or an option to terminate. Um, it's important to remember that it also excludes those cancelable periods. So periods during which both the government and the SPEDA vendor, they both have an option to terminate the SPEDA without permission from the other parties. Those are considered cancelable periods and are excluded from the subscription term. So things like a rolling month-to-month -month SPEDA or a SPEDA that continues into a holdover period until a new contract is entered into, those would not be enforceable if both the government and the vendor have an option to terminate and therefore either could cancel the speed at any time and you don't include those periods in the subscription term. A SPEDA is reported effectively the same as those for a lessee under Statement 87. So the government will recognize the subscription asset and a corresponding subscription liability, except for those short-term SPEDAs. The subscription liability should be measured at the present value of payments expected to be made during that subscription term, and it should include all payments expected to be made and any other reasonably certain payments. So if it's a variable payment that's um, expense or it increases based on CPI, then those would be included here. The subscription payments then should be discounted using the interest rate that SPEDA vendor charges the government, which may be the interest rate that's implicit in the SPEDA contract. If the interest rate can't be readily determined, then the government's incremental borrowing rate should be used. So the subscription asset uh, is comprised of three different things. Uh, the initial measurement of the subscription liability, which we went through on the previous slide. Any payments that are associated with the SPEDA contract to the SPEDA vendor when the uh, subscription term begins. And any capitalizable initial implementation costs. Those three items comprise your total subscription asset. So there is a little bit of an error in the slide that I saw right as uh, I was looking through these for the last time. The title of the slide should not say issuer commitment, but rather stages. Um, the activities associated with ESPEDA are grouped into three stages that are listed on this slide. So activities in the preliminary project uh, stage, those things include such things as evaluating alternatives. So which software is going to be best for your government? Uh, the existence of needed technology. So determining if you need what you need, and then of course the final selection of that uh, alternative for the SPEDA. As noted on this slide, any any costs that are incurred during this phase are expensed as they're, as they're paid or as they're incurred. Activities in the initial implementation stage, those things include ancillary charges related to designing a path, 
things like configuration, coding, testing, installation associated with the government's access to those underlying IT assets, uh, other ancillary charges that are required to place the subscription asset into service would also be included in this stage. And that initial implementation stage for the SPEDA is generally completed when that subscription asset is placed in service. So generally during this stage, outlays are capitalized. However, if there's no subscription asset that is recognized, maybe the, the SPEDA is a short-term SPEDA contract then those outlays would be expensive incurred. Activities during the operation and additional implementation stage kind of depends whether you expense or you capitalize. But activities that are incurred during this stage include maintenance, troubleshooting, kind of other activities associated with the government's ongoing access to those IT assets. Activities during this stage may include additional implementation activities that occur after the asset has been placed into service. And generally, during this stage, outlays are expenses incurred. However, if there, for example, is an additional module that was implemented at a different time, for example, you implemented a big ERP and you decided to not turn on the capital assets module, and then later on you decide to turn that module on, the outlays related to that module getting turned on could be capitalized for those costs that were incurred. Oftentimes when an organization is implementing a new system, you have to do some data conversion. So, and the standard specifically calls out data conversion and notes that it should be considered an activity of the initial implementation stage, only to the extent that it's determined to be necessary to place the subscription asset into service. So you could capitalize some of those costs. Otherwise, data conversion costs should be considered an activity of the operation and additional implementation stage and expense those costs as they are incurred. Again, uh, we're gonna add some new disclosures to the statement, but they're very similar to those that were added as a result of statement 87. You're gonna give a general description of those SPEDA contracts that you have, include the total subscription assets, and then of course the related accumulated amortization, the principal and interest requirements to maturity or to the end of that contract, and then commitments under CEDAs before the commencement of the term. So assets and liabilities resulting from these CEDAs should be recognized and measured using the facts and circumstances that existed at the beginning of the fiscal year in which the statement is implemented. So very similar to GASB 87. If it's applied to those earlier fiscal years, then those assets and liabilities should be recognized and measured using the facts and circumstances that existed at the beginning of the earliest fiscal year restated. Governments are permitted but are not required to include in the measurement of a subscription asset capitalizable outlays associated with the initial implementation stage and the operation and additional implementation stage incurred prior to, before the implementation of this standard. So you could include some of those costs, but you're, you don't have to. I'm gonna round out this standard with a polling question. So this is our third one. Which is the most significant challenge you faced or anticipate facing during adoption of GASB 96? So is it A, the initial data collection and creating a master list of all potential SPEDA contracts? Uh, utilizing existing software used for GASB 87 to help with GASB 96 accounting, developing new internal controls to ensure SPEDAs and any modifications to existing agreements are identified and communicated timely to the accounting department, or D, updating the financial statements and disclosures. And just as a reminder, please click the button that applies to you and be sure to hit submit so that you can get your CPE. If you were lucky enough to adopt this in tandem with GASB 87, then uh, you probably have this question down pat. Uh, that initial data collection seems to trip up a lot of our a lot of our clients related to just determining what contracts are in place and making sure that you have all of those captured. Okay, 
And just like that, the answers kind of reflect what I just talked about. That initial data collection is generally the most significant challenge that our clients face, just be sure, ensuring that the population is complete. Now I'll hand it back over to Kevin to talk through 99 and 100. Thank you, Ashley. So far, I agree with the uh, the polls that uh, the majority of you are answering. So uh, right on. So same in 99. Um, that makes me think of if you're an auditor or used to be an auditor, same in 99 was pretty juicy one in auditing standards that was related to fraud that uh, was very interesting. With Gatsby same in 99, we just have an omnibus. So um, not quite as interesting an omnibus is really just some housekeeping um, that we're going to incorporate. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but here are some of the key provisions. In regards to financial guarantees, a government that, extend, that extends an exchange or exchange-like financial guarantee should recognize the liability and expense related to a guarantee when qualitative factors and historical data indicate that it's more likely than not that a government will be required to make a payment related to that guarantee. And then with uh, derivative instruments, um, think of uh, Statement 53 that uh, provides that standard. Um, what the GASB was seeing was that there were some other type of derivative instruments out there that were outside of the scope, so they're trying to capture that. Uh, and what this omnibus says is that there's uh, three things that need to be followed for these other derivative instruments. The first is changes in fair value should be reported on the resource flow statement. So separately from the investment revenue classification, information should be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements, and that needs to be kept separate from hedging instruments and investment derivative instruments. And then finally, governments should disclose the fair values of derivative instruments that were reclassified, reclassified from hedging derivative instruments to those other derivative instruments. So that's that piece. Uh, on leases and speedos, variable payments that depend on an index or a rate or those that are fixed in substance should be included in the measurement of the lease liability. All other variable payments things like a future, the future performance of the lessee or the usage of the underlying asset should be included in the measurement of the lease liability. Now, lease liability should be remeasured solely for a change in an index or a rate used to, used to determine variable payments, nor should the discount rate be reassessed solely for a change in the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. And then the other ones that we want to touch on today, first with um, PPPs, similar to leases in GASB 87, a receivable for installment payments should not be remeasured solely for a change in an index or rate used to determine variable payments. Um, on the replacement of LIBOR, which is going away, for purposes of applying paragraphs 35 through 38 of Statement 53, as amended, LIBOR is no longer an appropriate benchmark interest rate for a derivative instrument that hedges the interest rate risk of taxable debt when LIBOR uh, ceases to be determined by the ICE Benchmark Administration. With regard to SNAP, state governments should recognize distributions of benefits from SNAP by applying the provisions of Statement 33 as amended. And then finally, with uh, non-monetary non transactions, a government that exchanges in one or more non-monetary transactions during a period, and that is required to apply paragraph 272 through 280 of Statement 62 to those transactions, should disclose in the notes to the financial statements the measurement attribute or attributes applied to the assets transferred rather than the basis of accounting for those assets. So um, 
There are some other provisions in here that I, I think are a little less applicable, but that's really the highlight of this omnibus. Um, now, something to, to keep in mind here is that they don't all have the same implementation date. So with regards to SNAP, non-monetary transactions, pledges, and some other um, uh, provisions, that's applicable already. The things related to leases, SPEDAs, and PPPs, um, those are going to be applicable for years after June 2022. And then financial guarantees, derivative instruments, we need a little more time. That's for years beginning after June 2023. All right, so now we're in the triple digits for accounting standards. Statement 100 on accounting changes and error corrections. Um, that's the thing that none of us, whether we're a preparer or an auditor, likes to hear is error corrections. But uh, I think ultimately this is a good standard. Um, it's really out there to, um, I think, a lot of folks are um, recording things like errors or accounting changes, changes in principle. And users of the financial statements are, are looking at these disclosures of financial statements and seeing a divergence in how uh, these sorts of changes are being reported. Um, previously, this was in Statement 62 that kind of brought in all the old FASB guidance. And it's nice that this now has its own accounting standard and also answers some questions that we didn't necessarily have um, guidance on uh, previously. So here are the, the types of changes that can occur with regards to accounting principles, accounting estimates, uh, changes to or within the financial reporting entity or correction of an error. With regard to a change in accounting principle, this is like the implementation of a new authoritative accounting or financial reporting pronouncement, like GASB 96 that Ashley just talked about. Or this could be a change in GAAP that is justified on the basis of a newly adopted accounting principle that you think is preferable to an accounting principle that was previously used. Um, it's been a long time since I've spent much time auditing commercial entities, but something that comes to mind is um, somebody has a lot of inventory may justify reasons to change from FIFO to LIFO. Um, you know, I don't think inventory is usually a big balance for governments, but that's an example. Maybe something more in the government chain um, realm that would be a change in accounting principle would be if you have infrastructure. It's often a big dollar amount if you, you have those capital assets on your books. You're using the modified approach, um, but you change to another election you can do, and that's just depreciating infrastructure just like any other uh, capital asset that's being depreciated. Another change would be an accounting estimate. So this is where... Um, an example would be, let's say, accounts receivable. We um, love to collect all of our receivables, but um, sometimes we have an allowance because we're, uh, we, we think that not everything is collectible, right? And let's say that we um, issue financial statements, the audit report is issued by the audit firm. That's all done, and we find out afterwards that um, uh, a large receivable balance is no longer collectible because the customer is bankrupt and, and you're so far down the, the line of creditors that you're, you don't think you're going to get paid at all. Well, that would be a change that you would make prospectively um, because at the, the time the financial statements were issued, you had no reason to believe that the uh, balance was not, was not going to be collected. So when you make these types of corrections, you're going to recognize that on a prospective basis. Something we didn't have as much guidance on previously was a change uh, to or within the financial reporting entity. Um, examples here are the addition or removal of a fund, uh, a fund that moves from major to non-major or the other way around, 
an addition or removal of a component unit or maybe you have a component unit that goes to or from blended um, or blended to or from discrete. When we have these sorts of changes, we're going to adjust the beginning balance for the reporting period only, so we don't have to go back to prior years. That's good news. And then the one that we don't like to hear about or see is the correction of an error. This occurs when we have a mass error, maybe gas gap is misapplied or facts were misused or incorrectly used before the financial statements were issued. This would be the case where we should know that that accounts receivable um, customer was bankrupt before we issued the financial statements. That would be the, that would be an error, right? That wasn't really an estimate. We knew it was totally not um, collectible. And when we have these sorts of corrections to make, we're not going to make them prospectively. We're instead going to correct all prior periods presented that are applicable to that year. Other provisions in the standard, the aggregate amount of, of adjustments to and restatements of beginning net position fund balance or fund net position as applicable should be displayed for each reporting unit. So it could be the general fund and the governmental activities. So we need to consider all the applicable uh, reporting units. I encourage you to look at statement 100 and see illustrations one and two. They provide excellent examples on um, ways you can present this information in a tabular format. Um, I think they're helpful because they show an example with at least four opinion units impacted and multiple types of changes. So hope you never be in the position where you have so many changes, but if you kind of want to see how to display that, uh, that's a nice illustration. Also, previous previous guidance didn't necessarily speak to uh, required supplementary information and supplementary information in uh, Statement 100 provides guidance. If there's a change in accounting principle, no restatement of RSI or SI needs to be made. In the case of a correction of an error, as you might expect, RSI and SI needs to be restated for all periods presented. When is this effective? Well, it's effective for fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2023, and all reporting periods thereafter. Now, practically speaking, I think this would be a good one to consider early implementing. Um, it has some good ways to present these sorts of changes. So if you're implementing SPEDA um, this year, you know, consider implementing Statement 100 along with that. And uh, I'll turn it over to Ashley to finish this off on Statement 101. Thanks, Kevin. So GASI Statement 101 is on compensated absences. It was issued a little over a year ago, back in June of 2022. So we have a little bit more runway on the standard before it's effective. So we have a few short slides on it, but before we go over the standard, let's go to our last polling question. Which GASI standard is being replaced by GASI Statement 101? Is it GASB 62? GASB 16, GASB 47, or GASB 65. Click the button next to the answer that you wish to choose and then click submit. A little bit of a test during our CPE today. stepped away from your computer, come back and answer your polling question. Give it another 30 seconds or so.
All right. It's split down the middle. That's pretty impressive, actually. Everyone is almost 25% evenly. And I should have looked it up, but I think it's Gatsby 16 that it's replacing Statement 101. So, or Statement 101 is replacing Gatsby 16. So that's the correct answer. All right. Types of payments. So governments commonly provide those benefits to uh, employees in the form of compensated absences. Uh, and there are various types of payments that are made, which are listed on this slide. So there are cash payments when the leave is used for time off. And then there's other cash payments, such as payment of leave when an employee severs employment from the government. And then there's non-cash settlements. There are also salary-related payments for defined contribution and OPEB plans. So salary-related payments are those obligations that a government incurs Related to providing that leave in exchange for services rendered, and examples can include things like Social Security or Medicare payments. So how do you account for absences, including salary-related payments? So in an economic resources measurement focus statement, the leave that hasn't been used uh, should be recognized as a liability when all of the items on this slide are true. So. The leave is attributable to services that have already been rendered, so the employee has earned it. The leave accumulates, uh, but not necessarily for sporadic events, like impacting a few employees. Things like parental leave, military leave, jury duty, those things are not things that should be accounted for in this particular liability. And then more likely than not, it's, it's going to be used for time off or um, other paid in cash or non-cash, but not necessarily transferred to or settled through a conversion to a defined post-employment benefit plan. Leave that has been used but hasn't been paid or settled should also be recognized as a liability, which is, is typically what's been recorded already um, under old guidance, so that shouldn't be new. In terms of no disclosures for those salary-related payments and leave absences. So uh, in the long-term liabilities disclosure in your financial statements, a government should present either a separate increase and decrease in the compensated absences liability, which I think is what is being done currently, or you can now net it as an increase or a net decrease in the liability and then just disclose that it's being presented net. So that's, uh, I think, a good change um, from my perspective, makes it a little bit easier for government to complete that disclosure. As I mentioned, it's effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2023. So that's our December 31st, 2024 and June 30, 2025 year end. Um, and then it is reported as a change in accounting principle under Statement 100, which Kevin just went through. But of course, earlier application is encouraged. So if you are excited about the standard and feel like you want to early adopt it, that is permitted. I think now would be the time to hand it over to Amy to go through some questions, but it looks like we're about out of time. Amy, what do you think? Um, yeah, actually, we are out of time. Uh, we did get quite a few questions, though, and we can definitely pull the list and follow up with everyone if that works for you. Yep, that works great. Thanks, Amy. Close us out. All right, perfect. And then to our audience, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, Ashley and Kevin if you have additional questions. Their contact information is in your console um, if you need that, or you can drop a note in the Q&A window. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And then finally, here's a link to a survey for today's presentation. Uh, your feedback is appreciated. And thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.